My friend Michael and I were in seventh grade. Our science teacher, Mr. Anderson, was an easygoing guy, and he was the chaperone for our end-of-the-year field trip to the Pineville Aquarium. It was a special place called Ocean Wonders, nestled amidst the lush greenery of our town. On the day of the trip, excitement filled the air as we boarded the school bus and headed toward the aquarium. We couldn't wait to see all the amazing sea creatures and colorful fish. Little did we know that our adventure was about to take a thrilling and terrifying turn. As we arrived at Ocean Wonders, our entire class flooded into the aquarium lobby, buzzing with anticipation. But Michael and I, being the curious and impatient 7th graders we were, decided to break away from the group. Mr. Anderson didn't seem to mind. He was engrossed in conversation with another teacher. We sneaked away from the lobby and explored the aquarium's passageways. Walking through the dimly lit observation areas, we marveled at the magnificent fish tanks and their vibrant inhabitants. The underwater world unfolded before our eyes, and we couldn't help but make jokes about Finding Nemo and the funny clownfish and dorryfish we encountered. In the midst of our laughter, a voice called out to us with authority. We turned to see a man dressed in cargo shorts and a green t-shirt. He asked if we were part of the field trip, and without thinking twice, Michael nodded and said yes. Assuming he was an aquarium employee, we obediently followed him. Instead of leading us back to the lobby, the man guided us through narrow, dimly lit hallways. We passed the bathrooms and noticed exit signs hanging above. The confusion began to creep in as we wondered where this detour was taking us. Eventually, we found ourselves outside in a secluded area, surrounded by trees. Feeling a mix of anxiety and curiosity, I mustered the courage to ask the man if he worked at the aquarium and where he was taking us. He replied affirmatively, explaining that he needed to drive us around to the front entrance so we could rejoin the group. It didn't make much sense, but we hesitantly climbed into the back seats of his car. As the car pulled out of the back parking lot, we expected it to turn right towards the aquarium's entrance. But to our surprise, the man turned left, driving us away from our destination. A wave of concern washed over both Michael and me, and we questioned the man about the change in direction. However, he remained silent, and within seconds we heard the unmistakable click of the back door locks. Suddenly, the man's demeanor shifted. He made a chilling threat, his voice dripping with menace. He warned us not to make any sudden moves, brandishing a large knife from his glove box. Fear paralyzed us, and we sat in the back seat, our hearts pounding, unsure of what to do next. The car continued uphill, the wheels navigating the winding road through a desolate and woody neighborhood. Eventually, the man pulled over to the side of the road in a remote area, far away from any houses or passing cars. He ordered us to stay put as he stepped out, knife in hand. With a sinking feeling in my stomach, I whispered to Michael that we needed to be prepared to run. As soon as I gave the signal, he wasted no time. I shouted, Run, Michael! And he bolted downhill. I followed closely behind, adrenaline fueling my escape. The man pursued us on foot, his heavy footsteps echoing behind us. In a desperate attempt to stop us, he hurled the knife in my direction. Miraculously, it missed me by mere inches, clattering against the ground. I didn't dare look back or pick it up. All I could focus on was reaching safety. We raced downhill, retracing our steps toward the aquarium. The man, realizing he couldn't catch us, eventually gave up. I later learned that he had retreated to his car and fled the scene. Through sheer luck and determination, we made it back to Ocean Wonders unscathed. We sneaked back into the group, feeling a mixture of relief and apprehension. We chose to keep our terrifying ordeal to ourselves, knowing that there was little chance of the man being caught. As we grew older, questions about the man's intentions lingered in our minds, but we pushed them aside, preferring not to dwell on the darkness of that day. I made a terrible mistake when I was just a young man. I stumbled upon something called the Deep Web while browsing the internet. It was like a hidden part of the internet where people talked about strange and unusual things. I was curious, so I downloaded a program called Tor that allowed me to access the Deep Web. As I delved deeper into this mysterious realm, I realized that not everything was as it seemed. Among the discussions, I, unfortunately, came across links leading to child pornography, which deeply disturbed me. I knew I had to stay away from such terrible things. However, curiosity got the better of me, and I found a link named The Black Pages. The moment I clicked on that link, 
A black page filled with red and yellow links appeared before my eyes. The red links seemed to contain the strangest content. There was one called Personal Assassin, and another named Dead Pets. Reading the descriptions made me realize just how messed up the deep web truly was. Despite my better judgment, I clicked on a yellow link that caught my attention. It took me to a new page, where I found something intriguing. A chat room called The Secret Society Chat. My curiosity urged me to click on it. Little did I know that this decision would lead to a terrifying turn of events. As the page loaded, it took an unusually long time, leaving me staring at a blank white screen for what felt like an eternity. Suddenly the page transformed into a sinister black background, and a chat box appeared. Adjacent to the chat box, a video screen turned on, showing a masked person in a dimly lit room. My heart skipped a beat when I realized my own face had appeared on the screen as well. I was horrified to realize that the website had accessed my webcam, even though I always kept it turned off. Panic started to consume me, and I desperately tried to close the page. To my shock, the taskbar, along with the minimize and exit buttons, had vanished from the top of the tour window. I attempted to use the Zatro plus alt plus delete command, but it seemed useless in this situation. Suddenly, a muffled, distorted voice emanated from my speakers. It was the person behind the mask, speaking through some sort of voice-changing device. I could feel the fear gripping me as he said, I still see you, James. The sound of my own name sent shivers down my spine. Determined to escape this nightmare, I pressed and held the power button on my laptop, praying for it to shut down. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, the screen went black, and the laptop powered off. I was left in a state of shock unsure of what to do next. Should I report this to the police? I doubted it would be of any use, since the deep web was known for its anonymity. Furthermore, informing my mom would only cause her unnecessary panic. So I decided to delete the Tor browser from my computer and attempt to move on with my life. However, my ordeal was far from over. Approximately two weeks later, my mom handed me a letter that arrived in the mail. It had no return address, and curiosity led me to hastily tear it open. Inside, on a piece of paper that filled the entire space, were three terrifying words. Don't come back. The sickening feeling in my stomach intensified, and I crumpled the paper, tossing it away. I hesitated to involve the police, convinced that it would be futile. The fact that someone knew my address and sent me that chilling letter left me baffled and deeply disturbed. And so, with a heavy heart, I carried on, haunted by the memory of my encounter with the deep web. I couldn't help but wonder who was behind it all, and how they managed to obtain my address. The fear lingered, a constant reminder of the dangers that lurk in the hidden corners of the internet. One day, during a family vacation, we decided to go on a tour to a mysterious and intriguing destination. As we embarked on our tour, I couldn't contain my excitement. Little did I know that this would turn out to be my worst experience ever. While browsing the internet for information about our destination, I stumbled upon a horrifying page. It had a dreadful name, Dark Secrets of the Forgotten. This page was like nothing I had ever seen before. It was buried deep within a link archive, hidden from ordinary eyes. The homepage described its sinister content with blood-red letters that sent shivers down my spine. It claimed to showcase human experiments conducted to prove that not all humans are born equal. The experiments targeted the most vulnerable individuals, like the homeless and unfortunate souls who had fallen into the clutches of these sick individuals. The descriptions were chilling, ranging from starvation and water deprivation to extreme pain, torture, infections, diseases, and even experiments on infants' tolerance to x-rays, pain, and heat. Despite my better judgment, curiosity got the better of me, and against my instincts, I clicked on the first link to view the experiment photos. What I witnessed was beyond anything I could have imagined. Innocent victims, people just like you and me, were subjected to unspeakable horrors. The images were so gruesome that I had to fight the urge to vomit. Still, I couldn't tear my eyes away. I scrolled further down the page, and with each passing image, the horror intensified. There was even a dedicated section displaying experiments performed on infants and toddlers. The depths of depravity seemed to have no limit. As I reached the bottom of the page, a small chat box suddenly appeared on my screen. It startled me, and I hesitantly typed, Who is this? The stranger evaded my question and instead asked, 
What was your favorite part of the site? I insisted on knowing their identity, and finally they revealed themselves as the site owner. Overwhelmed with disgust and outrage, I told the site owner that their actions were sickening and inhumane, and I vowed to report the site immediately, but little did I know the gravity of my mistake. The site owner paused for a moment, and then chillingly typed, Hmm, I see your name is Ethan, and you live in Greenfield, Massachusetts. My heart sank as I realized the person on the other side knew personal details about me. Panic and fear engulfed me. The stranger's final words, Have a nice day felt like a cruel mockery. I quickly closed the browser and slammed my laptop shut, trying to calm myself down. Without wasting a second, I dialed the emergency number and reported everything to the police. They arrived at our house promptly, and I explained the whole horrifying ordeal to my parents and the officers. The police understood the severity of the situation and advised us to find another place to stay immediately, in case this individual attempted to harm us. Thankfully, we had been considering a move before this incident, so my parents swiftly arranged for us to sell our house and find a new home. It was a whirlwind of stress and fear, and I felt guilty for putting my parents through such a traumatic experience. Throughout that month, I apologized to them every day, burdened with guilt and regret. I hoped that the site owner's knowledge of my personal information was merely a bluff, but I couldn't take any chances. The thought of staying in that house, knowing someone had invaded our privacy in such a terrifying way, was unbearable. Reflecting on that dreadful experience, I learned a valuable lesson. The dark corners of the internet hold no good for anyone. It's a place filled with dangers and horrors that no one should ever explore. The deep web, with its anonymity and twisted content, is best left untouched. My name is Audrey, and I am 26 years old. Just three days ago, something very strange and scary happened to me. It all began on a sunny day in the beautiful state of Massachusetts. I live in a house surrounded by tall, leafy trees with a long, winding driveway that leads to the road. Little did I know that this ordinary day would turn into a spine-chilling experience. As I was busy outside, cutting down a drooping branch from a tree near the entrance of my property, I noticed a peculiar figure walking along the side of the road. It was a clown, or rather, a person dressed up as a clown. This wasn't just any clown. This one looked like it came straight out of a terrifying horror movie. Despite feeling a little uneasy, I chuckled nervously and smiled in its direction. Normally, people who encountered these clowns would see them on the road while they were safe inside their cars. But my encounter took a much more disturbing turn. The clown slowly turned its head to face me while still walking towards the road. It felt like its gaze pierced through my very soul. However, instead of attacking me as I had heard from others, the clown turned its head back to the road and continued walking. I didn't say anything to the clown because, well, I guess I just didn't care enough at that moment. Nightfall arrived, and as I always did, I locked up the shed outside and turned off all the lights before heading inside to make dinner. Suddenly, I heard a faint noise coming from outside. It startled me, and I opened the kitchen window a little wider to listen carefully. The wind blew and leaves rustled, but I couldn't make out anything alarming. Trying to calm my nerves, I shut the window completely and resumed cooking. But then, out of nowhere, I nearly jumped out of my skin when I heard a heavy and aggressive knocking on the very same window I had just closed. My whole body went into panic mode instantly. I could feel my heart pounding twice as fast, and my hands were trembling. In that terrifying moment, I grabbed the knife that was sitting on the counter and mustered the courage to look out the window. However, it was so dark outside that I couldn't see anything beyond the glass. Once again, I struggled to gather the bravery to take action, something that needed to be done. I decided to turn on the patio light and go outside. Slowly, I walked over to the back sliding glass door in my kitchen, my finger trembling as I approached the light switch. After what felt like an eternity, I finally flicked the switch. The horror I feared would be waiting for me outside came before I even had a chance to step out. The patio light illuminated the same clown I had encountered earlier, standing right outside the sliding glass door. Its head was tilted like a curious dog, and its ugly mask stared at me intensely. I could feel my blood freeze in my veins. Instead of confronting the clown or threatening it, fear gripped me, and I sprinted upstairs to the telephone to call the police. 
The sound of heavy banging on the glass door followed me all the way up from my bedroom. It worsened as the clown started pounding on the door with both hands repeatedly. The steady knocking from before had transformed into a terrifying assault. To make matters even scarier, the clown began screaming like a patient from a crazy asylum. The sound cutting through the air alongside the relentless pounding on the door. Every minute that passed without the police arriving felt like an eternity, and I felt as though my life was hanging by a thread. Finally, relief washed over me when I heard a familiar voice outside shouting, What the hell are you doing? Get the heck out of here! It was my neighbor, Marv. He stormed over, rifle in hand, ready to protect me. I peered out the window and saw Marv confronting the clown, who quickly retreated into the woods. The police arrived shortly after and took down my description. They conducted a quick sweep of the property and left. Knowing that Marv would do anything to ensure my safety, he kindly offered me a place to stay for the night. There is a small town nestled near a mysterious lake called Foss Lake. The town was known for its peacefulness and friendly folks, but it also held a dark secret. A secret that had puzzled the townspeople for decades. It all began in the year 1969 when three people went missing without a trace. They were traveling together in a rusty old 1950 Chevy, heading to a football game. Their names were Jimmy Williams, Lee Johnson, and Michael Rios. The town was filled with worry and sadness as days turned into weeks, and there was no sign of the missing trio. But then, just a year later, another chilling disappearance shook the town. This time, it was three teenagers riding in a shiny new 1969 Camaro. Their names were Nora Duncan, Clem Byrne Hammock, and John Alva Porter. They too vanished into thin air, leaving their families and friends desperate for answers. Days turned into months, and months turned into years. The town was consumed by the mystery of the missing six souls. People whispered in hushed tones, wondering what could have happened to them. Some believed they had met with an unfortunate accident, while others suspected something far more sinister. Decades passed, and the mystery deepened. It seemed like the secrets of Foss Lake would never be revealed. But then, in a twist of fate, a group of police divers, during a routine training exercise, stumbled upon something that would change everything. As they dove into the depths of Foss Lake, searching for a lost artifact, they stumbled upon something unexpected. At the bottom of the lake, resting silently, were two cars. The first was Jimmy Williams' Chevy, and the second was John Alva Porter's Camaro. The divers couldn't believe their eyes. With cautious anticipation, they explored the cars. And to their shock, they found not only the bodies of Jimmy Williams, Lee Johnson, and Michael Rios, but also the remains of John Alva Porter, Nora Duncan, and Clem Byrne Hammock. The missing six had been right there all along, concealed by the murky waters of the lake. The discovery sent shockwaves throughout the town. The families of the missing individuals were filled with grief, but they were also relieved to finally have closure after all those years. The townspeople were left in awe, trying to piece together the puzzle of what had transpired. The authorities launched an investigation into this perplexing case, but the circumstances surrounding their deaths remain shrouded in mystery. The foul play seemed to be the most likely explanation, as it was too much of a coincidence that two groups of friends would meet such tragic fates within a year of each other. As the townspeople grappled with the revelations, theories began to emerge. Some believed that there might have been foul play involved, while others speculated about accidents or even supernatural forces but the truth remains hidden within the depths of Foss Lake. When I worked as a driver at night to earn some extra cash, something strange and chilling happened during one of my shifts. It was Friday night, the busiest time when people were either home or with friends, ordering food. Those nights were always buzzing with activity, and that's when I would usually work. On a particular Saturday night at 1 a.m., I received a request to pick up a McDonald's order for a guy named Martin. He lived just a few minutes away from my current position, so I quickly punched in the nearest McDonald's, which was only a two-minute drive away. Martin's order seemed small. He only wanted two hamburgers. His place was located about five to seven minutes away from McDonald's, according to the app's directions. As I followed the app's instructions, I found myself on a short, dead-end street that veered off another dead-end street. Martin's house was the last one on this secluded road, right next to a line of trees running alongside a quiet highway. It was eerily silent at that late hour, 
which sent a shiver down my spine. Reluctant to ring the bell and disturb the stillness, I decided to call Martin instead. I dialed his number, but it rang only once before diverting to voicemail. Puzzled, I ended the call. Just as I put my phone away, a text message from Martin appeared, instructing me to come to the door. Despite my initial hesitation, I made my way to his big wooden front porch. The moment the front door opened, I was greeted by a bald guy who seemed to be in his 30s. His bald head caught my attention, but I didn't judge since his personal style varies. However, what hit me first was his repugnant breath, a combination of alcohol and something indescribable. With his intoxicated state, I felt a bit unsettled. Nevertheless, I reminded myself to be open-minded and proceeded with the delivery. Typically, the payments were handled through the app, eliminating the need for me to wait around for money. However, Martin asked me to enter his house and place the food on his kitchen table while he fetched a tip. The prospect of free money enticed me, so I agreed to wait in his kitchen. The kitchen was tiny, illuminated by a small nightlight plugged into a nearby outlet. It emitted a dim glow, casting peculiar shadows across the room. An unpleasant odor hung in the air, but I couldn't quite pinpoint its source. As I waited, growing increasingly impatient, I decided to explore a bit. Stepping into the adjacent living room, I noticed that the TV was on, providing the only source of light. Yet, the stench intensified in this room. Curiosity got the better of me, and I approached the back door, which was partially slid open. Perhaps Martin had left it that way to freshen the house, I reasoned. Hoping for a breath of fresh air, I stepped outside onto the man's back deck. However, to my horror, the foul smell grew even stronger. It was then that I heard a haunting sound, the buzzing of flies, a swarm of them. My eyes widened, and I froze in place. Intrigued and unnerved, I decided to investigate further. The motion-sensing light near the back door suddenly switched on, illuminating two large black garbage bags. They were bulging with something long and unfamiliar. The unbearable stench overwhelmed me, and it took a moment for me to comprehend what I was most likely looking at. Dread washed over me as the realization sank in. At that moment, waiting for a tip didn't seem like a good idea anymore. A sense of urgency filled me, and I hurried back inside, rushing toward the front door. Just then, I heard Martin's voice echoing from the basement, calling out to me. He had a few dollar bills in his hand as he approached. Seeing me about to open the door, he asked where I was going. Panic rising within me, I quickly fabricated a reason, telling him I needed to check something in my car. He nodded, accepting my explanation, and headed toward the back door leading to the porch. I seized the opportunity and swiftly opened the front door. As I stepped outside, ready to flee, Martin's gummy smile vanished, replaced by a sinister look. In a firm voice, he demanded to know if I had been in his backyard. Fear gripped me, but I denied any involvement, assuring him that I hadn't ventured there. He stared at me wordlessly, suspicion evident in his eyes. Determined to escape, I mustered my courage, opened the door wider, and hastened to my car. As I started the engine, I couldn't resist the urge to observe Martin's front door, wondering if he would emerge once again. And he did. He bolted out of the house, running at full speed toward my car, clutching a menacing metal rod in his hand. My heart raced, and adrenaline coursed through my veins. I wasted no time and drove away, my mind already racing to contact the police and report this terrifying encounter. Within a few blocks, I dialed the emergency number, making sure to alert them before Martin could dispose of any potential evidence. I anxiously relayed the details, informing them of Martin's actions and the suspicious garbage bags in his backyard. The minutes passed like hours, but to my relief, I spotted police cars arriving at his house within a remarkably short time. From a safe distance, I watched as law enforcement swarmed the area. Following my instructions, they approached Martin and discovered his attempt to move the bags, which indeed contained lifeless bodies. The truth began to unravel before their eyes, confirming my worst fears. Everything about Martin's demeanor and his chilling actions fell into place. His open back door, the disgusting smell, and his unsettling behavior toward me. It was a nightmarish experience that left me shaken to the core. As the police carried out their duties, I couldn't help but feel grateful that I had escaped unharmed.